Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lone House Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again tonight. Hope everyone is doing well. So if this is your first time with us, welcome. If you are a repeat uh, friend of ours, you know the deal. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to go ahead and just uh, type them in and I will answer them as I can. So yes, thank you very much. All the best for the new year. I appreciate that. Same to you. I hope everyone is doing well. We've had a few changes. We've had a few things going on. Uh, I was out of the area off and on for the past three months. So we were kind of hit and miss. We should be back to full schedule now. Um, I ended up getting back a little bit later than I thought I was going to. So it threw some things off. We've got more interviews. I think the farm interviews did really well. So um, we're going to do more of those. I think it's important for us to get out and actually get to other farms so you guys can see different setups. You know, the reality is, is what we do, what you do, what your neighbor does, you know, it's all fine and dandy to see that. But, you know, I don't expect to be like your one and only. Uh, I wouldn't expect that. Uh, you know, that's not realistic. The reality is, is you're going to get little bits and pieces of advice from different people. Um, some of those things are going to work for you and some of those things aren't. And you should really be gathering information um, from a lot of different sources uh, just to see what works for you. Um, you know, not saying that people are wrong. Um, you know, not saying that because I do things a certain way that it's it's right or wrong. It just may be right for my situation. Um, it might not be right for yours. So I think the more information we can give you, uh, the more exposure we can give you to things, the better off you're going to be. We're actually going to be hitting a uh, show goat farm this weekend, uh, which is really exciting. I've had a harder time getting goat people um, to talk to than I have sheep people. And I understand that it can be difficult because, you know, we're doing lambing season right now. We just had um, our first run of lambs. Normally what you'll see with lambs or goats or goat kids is even if you use a cedar, even if you use a cedar and a progesterone shot, what you're going to notice is you're going to get your babies are going to happen in waves. Um, they're, most of your ewes and does are going to be more clumped together. They are going to have their babies at a closer time, but they're going to go in, in kind of groups. So our first group, uh, we normally see three groups. Let me, so let me back up there. So if you cedar, um, that is to say you're giving a suppository to a female, um, a progesterone suppository followed by in a shot of PG 600, um, it's going to cause them to cycle. And what's going to happen is some of those females are going to cycle right away. A few of them, the majority of them is going to, are, are going to cycle, um, about, you know, a week later, and then you're going to have some stragglers. So generally speaking, not a rule of thumb, but generally speaking, we see about three distinct groups. We see a few early birds, we see the mass bulk of them go, and then we see a few stragglers that go behind. And so what's occurring is some of these ewes and does are ovulating immediately. Some of them are, are hitting on the second cycle. They're having their first cycle is kind of like a silent heat. Their second cycle is where they uh, actually get bred. And then a few of them take a few times to get bred and they go at the end. Um, so generally speaking, that's what we see. So we just saw our first group of ewes go um, I think we had maybe uh, maybe 10 uh, lambs, 10 to a dozen lambs. And then we'll see our second group go together, which will be a larger group. Um, and then we'll have a few stragglers at the end. Generally speaking, that's that's the way that it goes. We did have an early bird. We had a, um, a range U from Montana that's kind of a longer, leggier U that had triplets in her. Uh, she just couldn't quite make it to term, and she went a little bit early. Um, so we do have a few preemies. We have a few bottle babies. Um, I have not grafted them. We did some shuttling around. We have grafted a few different babies to different moms this year um, just to kind of help size them up a little bit more. Uh, for instance, the you that had triplets that were mm -hmm. premature, one of the three was actually pretty good size. Um, uh, the problem was, was they actually weren't tall enough uh, to actually reach mom. Uh, to nurse appropriately. And so what we did was we ended up grafting him 
uh, to another mom that was a little bit shorter. They just so happened to be having babies at the same time. It was easy. We were able to to match them up and they were fine. Um, and so he's happy and doing well. The other two are bottle babies. We may graft them to another mom later on. Um, but for right now, um, I don't think I would necessarily trust them out uh, out on pasture or out in the dry lot with a mom right now. They're a little too frail and a little too small. Uh, so we're protecting them now. We don't bring them in the house. Uh, the only time we would bring these animals in the house is in an absolute emergency case where we're going to have to be giving medical care to them maybe every hour, every couple hours. Uh, these guys are staying outside. Um, they live outside. They're used to uh, the elements. We have them in a in a protected area in a barn, but they are outdoors and um, they will go out into general population as soon as possible. Um so, and we'll talk about that more here in a minute. I want to catch up on uh, some of our uh, some of our questions here. So, what's the purpose of docking tails? So, that is a great question. So, why do we dock tails? Well, we don't dock all tails. Um, primarily, you will see tails docked in wool breeds, hair breeds. We don't dock tails, generally speaking, unless you choose to do so. So the thought process behind docking tails, especially in the wool breeds, um, is twofold. First is we're doing it for a hygiene purpose. Um, the wool itself, when so we have to back up a little bit in time. And what was occurring for these animals that were being raised in large numbers and being raised out on pasture is the wool holds... Uh, feces really, really well. So when this animal is pooping, if they get scours, scours is a term we use in the industry for diarrhea. You may pe hear people ter use that term inter interchangeably, but if a lamb, if a wool lamb with a long tail gets scours or diarrhea, what tends to happen is, is that wool becomes soaked in that feces and it sets the animal up for a interesting uh, phenomenon that we refer to as fly strike. So what is fly strike? Fly strike is where an animal either gets blood or feces or just yick and yuck mixed in with their wool. It gets embedded in there and flies come along and actually lay their eggs in that manure on that animal. As those eggs hatch, they turn into maggots and those maggots begin to actually eat the animal. Uh, we refer to this as fly strike. Um, it's pretty rare that you see that anymore, but it is something that you need to watch for. So in the winter time, we don't worry too much about fly strike because it's so cold. We don't have a fly issue. If you ever find yourself to be lambing during warm summer months, uh, or even early fall when it's warm, flies become a really, really big issue. And we've talked about it in some of our other videos, but if you're going to be docking or causing a wound on an animal, uh, be it a goat or a lamb, uh, you need to make sure that you're spraying them with some kind of anti-fly, uh, like a permethrin mix, or uh, we like to use uh, Catron spray, uh, which is a permethrin aerosol spray that's made, I believe, by Bayer. Um, and we like to spray them to prevent fly strikes. So that's kind of the thought process behind docking. Now, docking, essentially, uh, if you're doing it just for health reasons, you'll actually leave that tail a little longer. And when we look at show sheep, what we notice is that tail's docked all the way up to the body. Um, on a traditional sheep that's being docked just for hygienic purposes, the tail will actually be left a little bit longer. That longer tail does a couple things. The first thing that it does, leaving it a little bit longer, is it actually comes down, covers the anus, and covers uh, the reproductive organs on the female, uh, and it allows some protection. The other thing that's beneficial about having a little bit longer tail is if that animal does get poop uh, in or like loose stool, like scours, that, that poop actually will ride up that tail a little bit before it falls off. And it actually helps to channel that um, feces away from the animal's body. Now, unfortunately, in the show arena, docking tails has become an aesthetic issue. And we have 
began to dock the tail all the way up against the body. Um, this is not ideal from an animal welfare standpoint um, because it's increased risk for infection uh, and some other issues can occur with that. However, in order to be competitive and to have the animal have the look that's desired in the show arena, uh, that's the way that it's done. The animal's tail is docked all the way up against the body. Now, there used to be some conjecture amongst people about this, and there was some thoughts that close tail docking could potentially lead to rectal prolapse because it was damaging um, some kind of tendons or things like that. I don't really think there's a whole lot of truth behind that. I do see rectal prolapse in animals from time to time in both sheep and goats, and almost every time that I've ever seen it, it had nothing to do with tail docking. It had to do with that animal being overfed. Uh, so overfeeding is number one culprit for rectal prolapse. Usually there'll be a there's a cough associated with it, and when the animal coughs, you'll notice a rectal prolapse. When the animal stops coughing, it'll go back in. Um, but good question. But generally speaking, your hair breeds they don't get docked. So you know your Katahdins, um, uh, your Dorpers, things like that. They do not get docked. If I have animals that I know are going to show, I will dock them close. If I want to keep, if I'm going to keep a female over as a replacement, you, I will almost always dock her a little bit longer. That way, the um, tail actually covers the vulva. So, good question. Hopefully that answered. Um, hopefully that answered your question for you. Hello, Kendig. Hope you are doing well. Looking uh, forward to the PA Farm show flying to PA Friday. Very cool. We'll keep us posted on that. Next week, let us know um, how that went. We'll be interested to uh, hear about that. My friend 44 Warlord, nice to see you. I hope you are doing well. It seems like most animals are birthing in the winter. Am I just imagining this or uh, do they birth much in the spring as well? So this comes down to, um, this is very complicated. This is biology. So the question is, you know, why do these animals have the babies when they do? All sheep and goats our all sheep and goats have, have a photosensitivity response um, that causes them to go into estrus. Now, we can get in the deep weeds of this, but essentially, the closer that animals breed um, was to the equator when it was originally founded, um, the less of a profound effect we see this in the animal. So, I'm trying not to get in the deep weeds here, but let me explain this to you. So basically in the fall, um, there's a part of the animal's brain uh, that registers the amount of sunlight that that sheep or that goat gets during the day. It, it just says, okay, we're getting this many hours of sunlight. As the hours of daylight start to shorten in the fall, it actually triggers something in the brain and it causes them to start to ovulate. Um, now, some animals are very, very sensitive to this. Other animals are not so sensitive to this. And again, that goes back historically to the breeds that they come from. Some breeds are well known to breed, quote unquote, out of season. Uh, they don't have nearly as much of a photosensitive response as others do. But what has happened, and this, of course, is hypothesizing based off of what the scientists say, the scientists say that what uh, occurs is, is these animals become pregnant in the fall. Um, and usually, if left to their own devices, they'll become pregnant in the fall. They will have their babies uh, in the spring. And once they have their babies in the spring, uh, it's just about the time that things are starting to bloom and the grass is starting to grow back in and it works out perfectly. So mom gets pregnant when the weather is still pretty decent, when nutrition is good in the fall and the nights are cool um, and she can keep that baby through the first trimester a little bit easier with less stress. She carries it through the winter and then delivers it um, and then delivers it at another time. So this is, um, you know, this is just the way that it goes. Now, things change um, based on the breed. And what you've noticed over the years is that 
what has actually ended up happening is people have selectively started breeding earlier and earlier and earlier. So why are they doing this? Well, a lot of the shows and a lot of the fairs um, have birthing constraints that are placed on these animals. Dates of birth are placed on these animals. So for instance, at a county fair in Indiana in July, the cutoff for these lambs was they had to be born by, we'll say, you know, they couldn't be born before December 1st, or they couldn't be born before January 1st. And so to get a leg up on this, a lot of people are selectively breeding their animals to be born earlier and earlier and earlier. If I can produce goat kids or lambs that are born in November or December, and the fair isn't until July, they have all of those months to grow and get strong and, and grow muscle and get trained and all of these things where if that baby wasn't born until March, uh, April, now I'm going to have a, a problem. You know, I only have a few months to grow and those animals aren't going to be even closely comparative to one another. So that's an issue that you run into. Now we select our animals to uh, be born a little bit earlier based off of hormones that we give them through suppositories and through um, selective breeding and other things. Now you look at an individual like Greg Judy, like Greg, um, Greg does not want his babies to be born in the middle of the winter because they're all out on pasture. They have no cover. It's not safe for them. He would start losing lambs like crazy. So he will purposely keep his rams out of his flock until later in the year. And he will purposely not even introduce those rams until very late fall. That way his lambs aren't being born out on pasture until March, April when it's already warmed up. Now, there are ways that you can fiddle with this. There's ways that you can change that based off of hormones and all kinds of other things. Uh, there's things like the ram effect uh, that'll change that. That is to say, if you have a group of females that have had males withheld from them for a long period of time, and now all of a sudden a male is introduced, uh, it will cause them in some cases to go into estrus. This is another kind of survival technique. Um, a lot of this is mother nature. You know, how many babies, how hard does the ewe or doe ovulate? What time of the year is the ewe going to ovulate? Um, you know, all of these things are really go back to mother nature and survival instincts. Now, the longer we get away from this and the more we raise these animals in captivity, uh, the more and more this starts to get muddled and get skewed. Um, but we still can see some pretty profound um, differences in the breeding characteristics of these animals. I can tell you in sheep, um, dorsets, <clears throat> pardon me, dorsets are well known for being able to breed out of season. Fin sheep are very well known for being able to breed out of season and be very prolific. Um, if you have a black face sheep, uh, like a Suffolk or a Hamp or a Shrop, and you're trying to get them to breed out of season, it can be really, really difficult. Um, same thing with goats. I find that boar goats, I don't have as much of a hard time breeding them out of season as I do with uh, some of the dairy breeds. So, you know, fill in the blank, see what works for you. But hopefully that helps to answer your question. Thanks for your help. Got my order today of the high octane feed. Good. Yeah, so the high octane feed, I really like it. It is a high fat, uh, high vitamin supplement. You can use that as a drench. You can use that as um, a top dressing. I have reached out to a company that actually, what they do is they actually make feed flavor additives um, for some of the big companies. And so I wish I could remember off the top of my head where they're from. I want to say they're from Iowa, um, but I contacted them last week. And what they're going to be doing is they're putting together a green apple, I think a Granny Smith apple flavoring additive for feed um, that we'll be selling soon. Now, the bad news is, is that they only sell it in like these massive quantities. The good news is, is I can buy that in the massive quantities and then I just break it down and sell it in smaller, um, in much, much smaller uh, quantities. So I think they told me it, this stuff, I can't wait to see it because I, I cannot imagine how strong this stuff is. Um, the gentleman told me that one level teaspoon of this would flavor 50 pounds of feed. Um, so 
this should be this should be interesting but that is awesome because now we'll be able to sell this in very small quantities for a very very reasonable price you'll be able to use it to top dress your feed and get animals to go after it a little bit more and that's kind of the same uh, thing that we do with the high octane feed additive that we have is we actually add a butterscotch flavor to it for those of you that have gotten our high octane feed additive before like it smells it smells awesome like even when i smell it uh, it's got like a butterscotch kind of a caramel uh smell to it uh and the animals just go nuts over it so you know, sometimes you need to give them a little bit of a boost. Sometimes they need a little bit of help to get them back on feed or to keep them from going off feed. Um, and that is a, a great additive to consider. So uh, lambing and kidding time, you know, what you're going to find, getting back to what we were talking about uh, with uh, Kindig was, you know, we're talking about what is mother nature, what is mother nature ingrained in these animals? Another interesting phenomenon that you have probably noticed, and if you haven't noticed yet, you will notice it, is sheep and goats love to have their babies in the dark. Uh, so this is an important thing that I want you to consider. Some people instinctively, when it gets close to lambing or kidding time, they want to leave those lights on all the time in the barn. Because, you know, we think about things like people do, right? We think, well, you know, if I had something going on that was going to cause problems, I need to see what I'm doing. Um, and so they think, well, if I leave the lights on in the barn, it'll help the mom out. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, sheep and goats love to have their babies in the dark. Generally speaking, you can't you can't definitively nail down. I've I have come to uh, come to find out, and I wholeheartedly believe uh, you cannot definitively nail down a darn thing about sheep and goats uh, other than you know uh they're gonna eat sleep and poop and drink water other than that like you never know what they're gonna do they surprise me all the time and so you got to be really cautious when you tell people things but i you guys are uh, i feel like we have a good rapport you guys know that i'm pretty much an open book with these things and so you know everything that i say nothing is necessarily definitive but uh, generally speaking, uh, sheep and goats love to have babies in the dark. And so what you're probably going to find is your sheep and goats, when they're starting to kid and lamb, are either going to have their babies just before sunrise or just after or at or around sunset. Um, and this is a natural instinct of theirs to deal with predators. As you can imagine, uh, they are much safer uh, to have those babies in the dark. If they have those babies in the dark, it is harder for them to be spotted. They're very, very vulnerable when they're having babies. Obviously, they can be attacked very easily. They want to protect those babies. It gives those babies time to, to be born, to kind of get up and get going, for mom to kind of get a handle on things and to recover. Um, and so generally speaking, you're going to see this. Now, we argue about this a lot between folks that raise animals. And it seems that the time of day that you feed seems to have some effect on what time of day these animals are going to have their babies. Um, and I have yet to be sold on, I believe it, but I don't, I don't understand it. Um, so we feed our animals primarily in the afternoon right about sundown. I feed my animals every for their main feeding. They get fed every evening, usually between 3 and 4 p.m. I get most of my lambs and kids uh, in the morning, generally speaking. Um, a lot of the producers that I know that feed in the morning get most of their lambs and kids at sundown. Now you guys will have to let me know. Let me know if you found this to be true on your farm. I would be very interested to know, uh, do you find a correlation between the time that you feed and the time that these animals have babies? So let me know uh, what you think and we'll talk more about that. All right. So back to it. Cody Bear Ranch. Hello, my friend. After kidding, what is the average time frame for the doe to stop the discharge. So um, it depends. Uh, 
Uh, I can see this go up to a couple days um, to a week. Um, discharge is normal uh, for these moms, and it just depends on uh, it just depends on the animal and how things go. So, what I have, uh, Doctor Kennedy from Pipestone, used to say that any time that you have to pull an animal, any time that your hand or fingers or anything get anywhere up near um, the birthing canal of that doe or uh, you, he would always uh, put in a uh, tetracycline bolus afterwards. Uh, so you can buy tetracycline boluses. Uh, they're a tablet, tetracycline bolus tablet um, that they give for calf scours. And he would always put a tetracycline bolus inside the doe or the ewe. And that was just to help protect against any kind of infection. Now, when I was a kid, if a ewe or a doe had a retained placenta, we would actually go in and pull it. Um, now, the more common way to do that is they will not pull the placenta. If they have a, a hanging placenta or retained placenta, they will give the tetracycline bolus. Uh, they will treat the you or the doe um, with some pitocin or some oxytocin, which causes them to contract a little harder. Um, and they will usually treat them with penicillin and they just let them pass it. A lot of the folks now, a lot of the veterinarians are saying they don't ever go in there and pull it. Um, but some discharge is very normal. This is that you or doe's body cleaning out remnants from what was in there um, during the pregnancy, any remaining bits of um, any remaining bits of placenta or anything else, um, and kind of shedding that lining and getting things back into healthy working order. And this can take anywhere up to two weeks. If you notice any discharge, that is normal. If you start noticing heavy amounts of discharge, heavy amounts of blood, foul smelling discharge, anything like that, your best bet is always to contact your veterinarian um, and to see what they have to say about it. But I would say that this is this is a normal phenomenon. Uh, so I don't necessarily think you should lose any sleep or if you see it, because you're going to see it. All right. Apple blossom boars. Hello. If you feed high protein, 19% alfalfa hay to pregnant does, would you bother to feed them grain as well? Uh, would they get enough from the hay alone as we would like to feed less grain or none and just high quality hay instead? Any thoughts on that? You know, that's a great, very appropriate question, especially for now. You know, grain prices are up so much. Uh, diesel prices, what's going on in the economy, all of this is really, really pushing grain prices higher and higher. Now, when we talk about grain that can mean lots of different things. Um, so some grains you think of intuitively and other grains you don't. When we talk about grains when it comes to sheep and goats and other animals, we're talking about a wide range of things. We're talking about soybeans. We're talking about corn. We're talking about oats. We're talking about all soybean hulls, um, all kinds of different things. Most of the products you buy in the big box store or at your feed mill are going to consist of corn and soybeans with some other additives in there. Um, soybeans are your primary source of protein in many cases. Uh, so soybeans are very, very high in protein. Now, if you live down south, you may run into, um, you may run into other things that are used for protein. Um, it depends on where you're from. But generally speaking, across the United States, we see soybeans that are used. The reason for that is, Soybeans are about 40% protein. Uh, to put that into perspective for you, corn is about 7%. Oats is about roughly 12%. And of course, not all things are created equally, but uh, it is generally speaking. So the question that we get asked a lot is, if, if I'm feeding good quality hay, do I need to feed grain? And the answer to that is, no, you don't need to feed grain if you have good quality hay. But for your insurance policies, the reality of it is, is the hay that you are feeding, uh, you need to be cautious. And so you need to verify that it actually is 
the amount of protein that you think it is. You actually, no kidding, need to get it tested. You need to get it tested frequently, and you need to make sure that you know you're testing every batch that you get. Ideally, I would like you to get a large uh, group of hay from the same person that was harvested at the same time from the same field because you want to get consistency. The other thing that you need to watch out for, and we just made the video about this, where we talked a lot about pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia and things like that, is the calcium issue. Now, if you're feeding a high calcium uh, forage mix that has something like you know alfalfa in it that has lots and lots of calcium, it's not nearly as big of a deal. But if you're feeding a grass hay that maybe doesn't have very much calcium, you're setting your animals up uh, for some calcium issues, which is going to be a huge problem that you don't want to deal with. Now, I always tell people this. If you're going to feed, I don't care if you feed just hay. I don't care if you feed hay and um, grain. Uh, we just went to Rick Adams' farm recently. Rick was feeding really bad quality uh, roughage just to keep the rumen going and was feeding really, really good quality grain. So you have every aspect in between. Um, it is never an excuse to not keep an eye on the nutrition that these animals are getting. People tend to think that, oh, well, if I only feed grain, then I, or if I only feed hay, then they're not going to get the nutrition they need and they can't get the medication that they need. And that's not the case. You know, there's good quality medicated free choice minerals that you can buy. So if you're going to feed just hay, that's great. You know, as long as it's meeting your needs, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that you supplement that hay with a good quality mineral supplement that's made for your species, be it a goat or be it a sheep. And you can get medicated. You can still give that animal decox. You can still give that animal the, the coccidia protection that it needs and still just feed hay. You're just giving that to them in a different um, in a different vehicle. And in this case, that vehicle is your mineral. Um, so we sell a uh, medicated mineral online at Foundation Feed or at at lanessafarms.com basically our whole website is just all in one now just go to lanessafarms.com our store is on there um and other people do as well so if i were you and you have access to this good quality hay then i would say heck yeah feed that good quality hay let them eat that let them get that protein everything's great you give them some mineral on the side you choose if you want that mineral to be medicated which i would recommend you know you want to protect yourself against coccidia you get yourself a good quality mineral that's medicated and consider putting out some um, sodium bicarb too, some baking soda, free choice baking soda. I, I really think that is just a super cheap way to um, to help uh, keep rumen health going, protect against laminitis and all kinds of other issues. Here's the other caveat that I would say. So we talked about watching out for our calcium. Uh, making sure that they're getting enough calcium. We always want to make sure that we've got about a two to a two and a half to one calcium phosphorus ratio. The other thing that I really want you to watch out for um, when it comes to hay is uh, mold. Very, very important for, for pregnant uh, ewes and does. Make sure you're not feeding moldy hay. And then the last thing I would tell you is uh, don't freak out and switch your feed. And this is a huge mistake that people make. Um, and again, you know, we go into these things with our best intentions and then things kind of get out of hand, right? So sometimes what you'll see is people will feed their animals a certain way. They'll feed their ewes or their does a certain way. And then it gets right up to about the time that they start bagging out. And then they say, oh my God, I need to start feeding them extra. Or I need to start feeding them this or feed them that. And they switch up that feed. They switch up that feed in that late, third trimester and they throw these ewes and does off feed and what i mean is is you know if you've raised sheep or goats for a while you know that anytime you introduce something new it's like a learning process right like someone will go after it some will eat too much others will go off feed and they won't eat anything they'll kind of snub their noses at it. and then after a couple of days it equalizes out the problem that you can run into is that transition period of switching up feed in late gestation can cause that can trigger that pregnancy toxemia or that hypocalcemia. Uh, and so don't do it. 
like fight the urge, like get a program locked in, get it dialed in, do what you're going to do, and then stick to your guns until, unless you have to, unless something crazy happens, stick to your guns and keep that program going until, until after they have their babies, after they have their babies, if you need to make a few changes, you know, add a little bit of grain and things like that because they're lactating. I think that's perfectly acceptable, but fight the urge to, um, you know, switch up that feed too late, uh, too late in the game. Hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, will kids gain weight on high quality alfalfa alone as well? Yeah, you're going to have to keep an eye on them. Um, I think, I think alfalfa, when you look at the pH of alfalfa alone, if you're getting like pure alfalfa, it's a little too hot. Um, that is to say it drops the pH a little bit too much and you're going to get animals spilling their cud and uh, you're going to have issues with that as well. Are they going to grow well? Sure. Yeah, they, they, they grow well if you have the right amount of protein in there and you're supplementing them with a mineral to where they're getting everything that they need. Um, I think you could see pretty decent growth. Now, are you going to get the growth that you're going to get off of free choice creep feed? I don't think so. I, I would love to tell you yes, but historically what I've seen, you know, there's a reason that a lot of these producers are feeding, um, are feeding free choice creep feed, high protein creep feed, um, from birth until weaning. And the reason for that is that it just it just makes them put on the pounds quicker. Uh, but again, you know, in the state that we're in with the economy and everything else, you got to crunch those numbers. So years prior, I would tell you that, you know, we always offer free choice creep feed uh, from birth until weaning. And the thought process behind that was, was the creep feed itself was relatively inexpensive. They were putting on weight very fast. I could get an animal up to 50, 60 pounds live weight at weaning, immediately take them to the sale barn and, and be done with them. Uh, there was no holdover time where if I was just feeding hay, um, even good quality hay, they tended to grow a little bit slower. Um, and so then I'm going to have to hold them over a little bit after weaning. Uh, and it's just more time. So those numbers worked. Those numbers worked two years ago. Those numbers don't work right now they may not work right now um i was crunching some numbers on some of our grains were up 40 percent of over the last two years so things are changing we're changing the way that we're feeding um, a lot of other people are changing the way that they're feeding and that's fine again just make sure that you're offering a complete balanced diet to these animals and just make sure that you're giving them the nutrition that they need uh, and if it's not going to be through grain then make sure they're getting it through the mineral uh, are they going to grow as fast? Long, uh, long answer. I just gave you short answer is I think they're going to grow faster on free choice creep. Um, but when you're crunching the numbers, just go with what makes sense for you and for your family and your farm. Are there any benefits to leaving a Ram all year long? Whew. Um, I don't know. Um, I could go through a long list of, of reasons I think you shouldn't. Uh, but as far as the benefits of keeping a ram in, I suppose if you had, if I had two ewes or two does, let's say I had a very small farm and I just wanted to do this for fun and I had very limited space, um, I might consider keeping a male in with two females uh, all year round. You just give up a lot of control. Um, and I recently had a conversation with a friend of ours over the weekend. She called and we talked and she said, I've got males and I've got females. Uh, I want to do what's right for all of them. I want to give them all the best nutrition I can give them. How do I do this? And my answer was, I don't know if I have an answer for you. Um, what's right for a male from a nutritional standpoint versus what's right for a female from a nutritional standpoint is not the same a majority of the year. Um, when it comes to protecting that male from urinary calculi and things like that, their diet tends to be a little bit different and needs to be a little bit different. When you have a lactating mom, her dietary needs are going to be a little bit different. Um, 
males tend to be more aggressive if you're in there and you're having to handle them all the time. Um, they're going to tend to get a little bit more aggressive when they use their estrus. You're going to lose control of when they're going to breed. Uh, you may find that one cycles at a certain time. Generally speaking, if you only have a few, they're naturally going to cycle together regardless. Um, males can be aggressive uh, with lambs and kids. It's not super duper common. However, um, we have seen some horrible things happen uh, with adult males that were left in with kids and lambs uh, to where they just killed them. Uh, so, you know, you've got the urinary calculi issue, you've got the aggression issue, you've got the um, overall nutritional, the, the losing of control over the timing of the babies. But, you know, I understand, like, people have limited time, they have limited space. You know, if you have a male by himself, you can't keep any of these animals alone. It's not healthy for them from a mental health standpoint. So now you've got an issue where if you're going to sequester a male by himself, he needs to have a buddy in there with him uh, or he's just going to go bananas. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things to consider there. I would say the benefits of keeping your males separated far outweigh the benefits of keeping a, a combined herd uh, all together. But again, you have to look at what works for you and what works best for your situation. You said their main feeding is that to suggest that you feed more than once a day. Yes. Um, so I think it is important to, uh, I think it's important to lay eyes on your animals twice a day. I think it's important to check on them at minimum. Uh, sunrise and sunset. Now, you may not be an early bird, um, but if if we're saying perfect perfect world, best case scenario, if you're going to find hurt animals, if you're going to find babies, if you're going to find problems, you're generally going to notice it first thing in the morning or you're going to notice it at, in the evening. Just in, instinctively, that seems to be the way that it works, especially a lambing or kidding time because the way that they're having their babies um you're going to want to go out and check on them twice a day. I find that if you're limiting feed, so, you know, if you've got a round bale or if you've got free choice feed, it's not as big of a deal. But if you're offering flakes of hay or grain or any of those things, it's going to be better for that animal to be fed a couple times a day than in one big meal. Um, it's just not natural for them to just get one big meal per day. We will go out and so, for instance, our, I'll give you an example. Our pregnant ewes and our pregnant does right now are on a diet mainly of good quality, uh, first cutting grass alfalfa mix, um, one flake per head per day. And they're getting an average of about one pound per head per day of good quality medicated grain that's about 18% protein. They get the hay offered to them uh, twice a day, the good hay, um, and then they're getting grain offered to them in the evening. Um, so we're giving them enough hay to kind of keep their room and cooking and keep them cud chewing throughout the day um, to where they're never really doing without that. Um, and then we're giving them the grain once per day. Uh, you could split that up even more. It's all going to depend on your time. Um, my main concern for you would be just consistency. If you are in a situation that you can only feed once per day, um, then I would beg you to just make sure that you feed them at the same time every day. Um, it will help them out immensely. They'll, uh, be happier and healthier, uh, and it tends to work a little bit better. I'm thinking about building some lambing jugs. From what I've seen, four by five jugs seems to be the standard. What are your thoughts on the sizes? So when 44 Warlord is talking about a lambing jug, this can be, these are referred to in many different ways. You may hear them referred to as a kidding pen, a lambing pen, a lambing jug, a kidding jug. What this is, is this is essentially a pen that is small enough for one mom and her babies to be in there together. So what's the thought process behind this? Well, 
there's some confusion about what a lambing jug or a kidding jug is and what it is not. The process, the thought process behind it is, is we allow that you or that doe to have their babies out in uh, a controlled general population. Maybe you've got all your pregnant moms together. They have their babies. Once they have their babies, once we'll use a you as an example. I have all my pregnant ewes that are together here on Lanosa Farms. All of my pregnant ones are in a confined area together. They are actually not completely confined. They can get outside and get fresh air and then come back in when they want. Once that ewe has her babies, I will actually take that ewe and her babies and I will move her immediately into, once she's cleaned them off and they're up, I will move her and her babies into a lambing jug, a lambing pen. And these lambing pens can be anywhere from four foot by five foot to five foot by eight foot. I think my lambing jugs are about five foot by eight foot. And you're going to have to make a determination based on the size of your animal. Um, if you've got really big animals, they may need to be a little bit bigger. If you've got really small animals like Nigerian dwarfs or pygmies, it may be a little bit smaller. You put that mom with her babies in there and they're just in there alone. This allows that mom to bond with her babies and those babies to bond with mom. They're in there together. There's enough room for them to move around, lay down, stand up. So mom's not laying on babies. Um, you've got food in there for mom. You've got water in there for mom with electrolytes. You're giving her a little bit extra nutrition that she doesn't have to fight for so she can stay healthy and take care of those animals and it allows them to bond they recognize each other they bond mom gets used to their smell they get used to mom's bleat her her buying or whatever she's doing and and vice versa and that way when we release them back out into general population they know each other they're comfortable with each other and we know we've confirmed that no kidding this mom is feeding her babies her babies are doing good they can fend for themselves. Mom is healthy. And then we kick them back out into a pen area where all the pregnant or all the moms are out there with their babies now. So we've moved from one area to the lambing jug to the other. Um, so a couple problems and a couple mistakes that people make. You want to allow your ewes and your does to have their babies in open general population with other pregnant moms. The reason for this is, is they need room. They are uncomfortable. They're going to stand up. They're going to sit down. They're going to flop around. They're going to, you know, spin in circles and do all these different things while they're having these babies, getting their babies into position. There is a mistake that a lot of people make. And what they do is as soon as they see that you or that doe go into labor, they grab them, they drag them over to a lambing or a kidding jug, and they put them in there. Now, a couple bad things just happened. One, you just stressed out that mom that was in the process of delivering her baby. You've interrupted the birthing process, and now you've lengthened that birthing process. Their contractions and everything are going to now slow down. She's going to have to get her senses back about her. She's stressed out, and she's going to have to start the process all over again. It slows down the birthing process. The second problem is, is when you take this ewe or this doe and you cram them in this little pen, they don't have enough room to get up, get down, stretch out, and deliver these babies. And we see it happen over and over and over again where that you or that doe accidentally crushes, lays down on a baby, or kills a baby inadvertently because she's in too confined of a space. So let them have those babies in open population. Then let them clean them off. Just chill out, sit back, and watch them. And then you can move them into that lambing or kidding jug. The next question that people have is, okay, well, how long do I leave them in there? That depends on the mom. Some of these moms are just super fantastic. And within 12 hours, you're like, she's got it. The baby's got it. We're good. Other moms, maybe their first time or they're kind of a little goofy or they're a little aloof or you're having problems. They may need to be in that lambing or kidding jug for three days. Maybe mom had a difficult birth and she's a little sick and you need to keep an eye on her. Maybe, you know, babies are a little bit stressed. So play it by ear. Most of our moms, we would say, are in and out of the lambing jug or the kidding jug within 24 hours, um, but we have seen them go as long as a week. So uh, it gives you a nice environment to give your shots. The babies are you know, captive in one area. You can get in there. 
you can check out mommy and do everything you need to do. That way that baby is ready to rock and roll when you pull him out of that jug and you put him back in general population. So hopefully that helps uh, answer your question. Good question. Thank you very much. Winston. Hi, Winston. I have a doe pregnant with four babies. Wow. And one doe pregnant with three. How much calcium should I be giving? I heard the last month of pregnancy, they need more calcium. Yeah. So uh, calcium is important and calcium phosphorus ratio is important. So again, I always want you looking at your feed, whatever feed you're giving them. And I always want you to make sure, I think a great rule of thumb is, and universities vary. Some universities will tell you, It'll vary from either one and a half to one or two and a half to one uh, calcium phosphorus ratio. So you always want to make sure that your calcium, I think a good rule of thumb is two or higher. So that means for every one part phosphorus, you have two parts calcium. Um, that is very important. What is an easy additive of calcium? Well, if you have a good quality mineral, that's perfect. Um, a lot of the old timers, when I was a kid and we were mixing up grain and I still do it today, I add crushed limestone, uh, to my feed. Um, so I will add, uh, 10 pounds of crushed limestone for every ton of feed. Uh, so you can do the, you can do the math on that 10 pounds for every 2000 pounds of feed. Uh, and that's crushed limestone. That's barn lime. If you go to the big box store, if you go to tractor supply, <clears throat> excuse me, or a rural king, you'll see these bags of barn lime. That That's not quick lime. That's not any any other kind of, that's not hydrated lime or any of that other stuff. It is just going to say barn lime. And if you look at the ingredients on there, what you're going to see is it is 99.99999% crushed powdered limestone. And if you look up what crushed powdered limestone is, it is like 98% calcium. That is what it is. And so if you're in doubt, you can you can always give more calcium within reason. Um, you can simply add crushed limestone to your feed. That is a very, very inexpensive way to add it. Now, you know, if I'm mixing up 50 pounds of feed in my mixer, I'll add like a half a cup of crushed limestone in there. And it just gets mixed in. It's powdery. You don't even see it. Uh, it just gets mixed right in with the feed um, and it sticks to the feed and you're good to go. Now, anytime I'm adding powder to my feed, uh, it's pretty simple process. Any, any kind of mineral or powder or anything, I put my feed in my mixer. I make a well in it. I pour some molasses in there. I cover it up. I mix it up so all the feed is actually covered in molasses. Then I add my powder. I continue to mix it. All that powder sticks evenly to all the different all the different uh, feed pellets, and then I pour it out, and I know that they're getting a, an even amount. Um, but when in doubt, you need to give more calcium. Watch that calcium phosphorus ratio, and that can be done just by reading labels on your on your feed uh, or getting your hay tested. And then when in doubt, you can always add some crushed limestone to your feed to help give a little bit of a boost uh, to that calcium ratio. So, and very very important because we want to. Uh, help prevent things like hypocalcemia uh, in in our um, animals. So thank you for the question. All right, next question. I feed them alfalfa, oats, barley, sunflower, and timothy pellets. Okay, so what you would have to do is you would just have to, um, you'd have to look at the nutritional value of each one of those items. You, you know, Google is your best friend in this, in this uh, case and see what your calcium to phosphorus ratio is in that. Um, if you needed to add more calcium to it, you know, you, sh you should be adding some kind of a free choice mineral uh, with vitamins and make sure they have everything that they need. Um, if you're getting a good choice, a good free choice mineral that should have an adequate amount of calcium, you just have to be cautious, do your homework and check that out. Okay. They have hay all the time, baking soda and minerals. That's great. Uh, be cautious of hay belly. Um, we're going to talk about this soon, and I know we've talked about it a lot before, and you guys are, are pretty up to speed on this. What is hay belly? Um, so a lot of new folks, and even some of the more experienced folks, 
um, they'll look at an animal and they'll say, man, that you or that doe is really fat. Uh, I've heard them say that before. I've, I've gone to farms and you look at an animal and they're like, man, she's really fat. And that animal is like severely malnourished. And they're like, what on earth are you talking about? Do not go off the belly size on these animals. Do not, do not look at the belly and say, oh, well, they're over fat or they're under fat or, or, or whatever. You have to check the fat cover on these animals. Excuse me. You have to put your hands on their ribs and you have to actually feel the fat cover on these animals. Um, you can do this with any of your animals. You can do this with your dogs, your cats, your sheep, your goats, whatever. Feel that rib cage. Put your hand over that rib cage. If you're feeling nothing but bones, that animal, I don't care how big their belly is, that animal does not have a good fat cover. That animal is underweight. If you can't feel any ribs at all, because they've got so much fat over the rib cage, then that animal's over conditioned. Uh, over conditioning is a bad thing. You know, we don't over conditioning can be just as bad as being a little under conditioned. If I had to pick an animal uh, to to breed, as far as like uh, in the fall putting my bucks or rams out there with them, I would take a slightly under conditioned ewe or doe any day of the week over a overweight, over conditioned. Uh, you or doe. So, you know, don't get too, don't get too um, hung up on how big the belly is. The reason I bring this up is, is a lot of times with free choice hay, I'm not necessarily a fan of free choice hay, but I get it. Like, trust me, like, I understand that some of you, like, there's no way you can go out there every day and, and break down bales and feed everything. Um, so I understand. So I'm not beating you up on that. But what I'll tell you is watch out for hay belly and make sure that you're not fooling yourself when it comes to body condition. And free choice hay will cause hay belly. It'll cause that bloating in the belly, and it can fool you uh, by looking at them without actually putting your eyes on them So, uh, or putting your hands on them. Excuse me. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. Do you sell medicated mineral that you can feed to the males and females? Or would you have to buy different for each? If so, which would you prefer? So we carry um, at lenossafarms.com, we carry Decox and we carry um, Bovatech. We actually are about ready to put Rumensin out there as well. All of these are coccidia medications. Now we already have these broken down into 10 pound packs and I've already done the math for you. So if you wanted to medicate your any feed you have you can if uh, any feed that you have you can medicate with for instance the decox a 10 pound pack of our decox is already pre-measured and pre-done to where you simply add that 10 pounds to a ton of feed that's the ratio that it is so it's very easy to do the math breakdown on that as well i think it would come out to you could figure it out for ounces like how many ounces would i add to 50 pounds it's just pre-made for a ton so if you had a ton of feed in a mixer, you could just cut that bag open, dump the whole bag of decox in there, mix it up, and you're done. In the case of most of us that are mixing up, you know, 50-pound bags or whatever, you can very simply just do the math, figure it up, and just add a little bit of decox to that 50 pounds and get everything treated. So that's the benefit of, of treating uh, males, females, whatever. If you have a feed that you like and that feed's working for you and it's not medicated and you just want to medicate it, it's a very, very cheap, I think for enough decox to treat a ton of feed, I think it's like $35. So very, very inexpensive. Um, and for most of you, that's going to last you a long, long time. Um, we have a medicated mineral uh, that is made specifically. So we have a ultra goat that uh, mineral plus vitamins plus decox that I have got formulated and made for us that it would go to your does. It would go to your pregnant does. So for instance, we had some individuals talking earlier and they're like, I just feed hay. I don't feed grain. Okay, cool. Now, how do we overcome that issue of not having uh, a carrier to medicate these animals for coccidia? And that's where we came up with this mineral. So the only mineral that we sell, the mineral that we sell, we sell a no phosphorus mineral that is designed just for males. Um, everything else is, is formulated correctly to be safe to feed to males and females. However, 
for my money, as much money as I spend on my breeding males, like I want to give them no FOSS as much as I possibly can. Our breeding males do eat our ewe feed and our doe feed when they're in their breeding um, and going through the breeding cycles. But other than that, I try to keep the feeds completely separated. So like our ultra buck or ultra ram or ultra lamb or ultra goat kid feeds actually have the proper um, calcium phosphorus ratio in them. And they also have added ammonium chloride to help protect against urinary calculi. So I get asked this a lot. They're like, okay, what product can you give me that's good for everything? And the answer is I can give you a product that's pretty good for everything, but I can't give you a product that's really good for everything. I can give you a product that's really good for males. I can give you a product that's really good for females. I can give you a product that's okay for both. Um, if you have any questions, if, if any of you guys are ever watching this and you're like, man, like I have this going on and I need to know, just shoot me an email, give me a call, whatever. We can look at your situation. We can figure out what you need and, and we can go from there. And you may be able to get it from me. You may be able to get it local. It may be cheaper. I don't know. We, we would just have to crunch those numbers and find out. So good question. Hopefully that answered, um, answered your question somewhat. Would you separate does for kidding? Uh, how do you stop them from fighting when you put them back together? You're always going to have a pecking order. Um, you're, you're just always going to have a pecking order. Uh, anytime you reintroduce new animals, females are worse than the males. Uh, sometimes about fighting. You really can't stop it. Um, usually it's pretty quick. You, you know, if you put them in an open area and they got enough room to get away from each other, they're going to headbutt a little bit and then they kind of get over it and it is what it is. Um, so our process is, is all of our pregnant females are in one area. They stay in that area with nothing but pregnant females until they deliver their babies. Once they deliver their babies, they go to that lambing or kidding jug after that they go into another general population area of all the moms with their babies now um, if they're not pregnant uh, if they're not going to have babies whatever we would keep them right now they're with the pregnant mom so like our replacement use and stuff like that a lot of big farms that have the space to do so will keep their replacement use and does that are not pregnant and are not going to get pregnant in their own area and they get fed their own feed you're just going to have to kind of you're just going to have to kind of figure that out why do we go through this process like why do we why do we keep our pregnant ones in one area the lambing and kidding jug and then our ones with babies in another people are like okay well why are you doing this why don't you just take them from pregnant to lambing jug and then throw them all back out in general population again and i have an answer for you some of these babies depending on the breed are very very aggressive they're very, very aggressive nursers. Uh, they're always hungry. They're always, they'll just go up and steal milk from whoever they can. You will set yourself up for trouble if you take all your pregnant animals, put them together, go to the lambing jug, and then just go all right back to that general population. Because what's going to happen is those lambs and those kids, the aggressive ones, are actually going to go up and they're going to start trying to nurse on your ewes and does that are bagged out that their milk is coming in that have not yet had their babies and they're going to irritate them they're going to stress them out they can cause them to start lactating early and if there is any colostrum in there they're going to steal a lot of that colostrum so now you've got a ewe or a doe that's constantly she's pregnant she's constantly stressed out because these aggressive babies are trying to sneak off of her a lot of times their udders become chapped and red and sore. And a lot of times they'll lose their colostrum. So now you've got a mom that's having a baby. She doesn't have colostrum the way that she should. She's already at a deficit because she's irritated, chapped, and red. And so now when her baby tries to nurse off of her, you're going to have all kinds of problems. It's best to keep them segregated in that area. Again, pregnant moms together, lambing or kidding jug as the intermediary, and then to a controlled environment where all the moms with babies are together. And hopefully that makes sense. Two ewes and one ram. And that's okay. Um, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel here. 
Um, if you only have two U's and one RAM, chances are they're going to uh, they're going to cycle close together if left to their own devices, <clears throat> and just do the best that you can do. If that's all that you're going to have, um, just be really cautious with that mail. When you go in there with the mail, don't overhandle them. You can talk to them, you can smile at them, whatever. Don't pet their head, don't rub them. Don't interact with that male any more than you have to. And you always, always, always have to watch. You know, you will go into that pen 200 times, and that 201st time, you're not going to be paying attention, and that ram is going to clobber you. Even the most docile rams and bucks, when those U's and does go into estrus, can get a little squirrely, and they can take you out. And if you have ever been hit by a ram or a buck, uh, you know this is not a good thing. Even from one or two steps away, they can take you out. Um, and they're usually going to be hitting you right about the knee or at the hip uh, or at the thigh. And you don't want to break a femur. That is not a, a pleasant way to, to uh, spend your spring. Hi, Tim. What do you suggest to use as free choice creep? And can you use soaked beet? pulp for kids also you know cheryl that is a great question that i don't have an answer for um i have never used soaked beet pulp for kids um so a creep feed an ideal creep feed for uh, lambs and kids would be a 16 to 20 percent would really be pushing i think that's overkill for a lot of people but I'm going to say, you know, between 16 <clears throat> and 20% protein, free choice. Um, and that should be, you know, it's going to probably going to be medicated uh, for coccidia. Uh, it's going to be a complete pellet. Ideally, it's going to have some ammonium chloride in there. It's probably going to be corn and, and soybean based um, and in a pellet form. They, they will go after a pellet. <clears throat> it tends to last a little bit longer. That seems to stay fresh a little bit longer. They seem to go after it a little bit better. Um, that's what I would consider. Um, and you're just going to have to kind of play it. You're just going to have to kind of play it by ear. I don't know about the bee pulp. I've never tried it. Um, so maybe you'll want to try it and let us know. Uh, I would be concerned. I, we want to get them on creep as early as possible. Now, when I was young, and some of the uh, folks still do this, to get those lambs and goat kids going on creep, we want to get them going as fast as possible. And there's a few tricks that you can use to help this happen. Uh, lambs and, and kids don't necessarily like those big pellets. You might be able to find a mini pellet. Um, it depends on your local farm uh, store and co-op and if they have a mini pellet. The other thing you can do is just get yourself five or 10 pounds of uh, rolled soybean or um you know crushed soybean soybean meal and what we used to do when i was a kid was we would actually take soybean meal and we would put some soybean meal in uh the creep feeder with the pellets and those lambs and goat kids really go after that soybean meal it's very fine consistency it's almost like cornmeal and they'll go after that once they get a taste for that they just kind of start going after the pellets and it goes from there so soybean meal is a great way to get them kind of give them a kickstart. If left to their own devices and you just have an open free choice creep, what you're going to notice is, is you can put it out there from birth and introduce them to the creep, uh, but the chances are they're probably not really going to start going after it for about uh, a week and a half to two weeks. Lambs are going to take a little bit longer than goat kids. I've seen goat kids, you know, chewing on hay and eating creep like two days old, three days old. Lambs, man, eh, maybe about two weeks. It's also not uncommon for your animals to get a little bit of scours um, when they first start going after creep. You will notice that. Maybe for that first day after they start going after creep, they may get a little bit of diarrhea, and that's normal. Just watch them and make sure that it resolves um, and keep an eye on them. When in doubt, call your veterinarian. So hopefully that answers your question. And like I said, if you want to try the beet pulp thing, uh, Cheryl, feel, feel free and let me know how that goes for you. Um, I don't think you're going to hurt them, but, you know, I've just never done it. Hi, Lee. When should I pull my ram out of my ewes? I think they're all bred for April, early May lambing. When I pull him, is it a must that he has a companion? 
and does it need to be a female? So these are a lot of great questions, Lee. So I like to leave my males in there as long as possible. As long as they're behaving themselves, um, I like to leave them in there as long as possible. So the reason for that is, is I want to make sure that everyone is pregnant. What you'll generally notice, and again, we're talking generalities here, is when the ewes or does get really close to having their baby. Um, they will lose their mucus plug. They'll maybe start to get some discharge, things like that. And it seems like it confuses the males in some cases. What we'll see is if you have a male that's been left in with pregnant ewes or does, um, about a week out from lambing or kidding, you'll notice that uh, that fleshman's response where they're curling up their lip. Um, you'll notice the um, uh, aggressiveness. They may start getting aggressive again. They may start trying to mount those uh, use or does again. They may start ramming them and things like that. I think that's waiting a little bit too long. I think that keeping your male in there with them until you see them start to bag out, um, because normally if, they, if they're if they starting to bag out ever so slightly to where you're like, oh, yeah, I think that's a great time to pull them. Um, I think waiting until they're, you know, really close to having the babies, I think that's a little bit too long. Keeping these animals uh, in groups is important for their mental health. You know, these are herd or pack animals. Uh, they're used to traveling together. And mental health-wise, they do not do well by themselves. Uh, they become depressed, they become destructive, they go off of feed, they become, you know, mean and all kinds of other problems. So keeping them in with a buddy is important. You don't have to keep them uh, in with a male or with a female. Um, I think the males do a little bit better if you keep them in with what's called a sacrificial ewe or a sacrificial doe where they have a lady friend in there with them. Um, but we keep all of our males together, um, you know, and that's a whole nother story about how to successfully do that. Um, we've kept males in with weathers uh, as long as they have a buddy. Uh, we've kept uh, rams in with goats. You know, we, we've done all kinds of things. We've kept uh, sheep in with mini cows. Uh, it just it just depends. So <clears throat> our males uh, go in with our mini cows, um, but they all go in together. So um, they need a buddy. I think that's very important from an animal welfare standpoint. Um, and I think it's better for them in the long run. But again, they start to bag out, start to show a little bit. Good time for you to go ahead and pull them and get them out of there. Hello, just found you on YouTube. We bought two goats. That's awesome. They're supposed to be grown. <laughs> the problem is we found them on Craigslist. And uh, what we thought we were, uh, uh, it seems like I may have cut you off. So <sighs> Craigslist is fun. Um, you never know what you're going to get on Craigslist. I'm glad that you found us. Um, there is a video that we have on YouTube that you can look at, and we show you how to age your sheep and goats based off of their teeth. Um, you can look at the mouth of your sheep or goat, and you can tell about within about a year of how old they are based off their teeth. So go ahead and do a search for that. Check out their mouths, and, and that should give you a good idea. You can't go off a size. Um, you know, all animals grow at different rates. Some grow really fast, some grow really slow. Um, some just are naturally smaller, some are naturally bigger. So check out those teeth. Check out the video that we have. Just do a simple YouTube search of Lanessa Farms, uh, checking teeth or aging a sheep or goat. Um, and I'll actually put a link to that in the description of this video when we're done doing the live stream. Um, but that would be what I would tell you to do to check that out and go from there. Okay. What are the electrolytes you use? I use a product called Blue Light. Um, you can purchase this on Valley Vet. I believe you can purchase it on, I think Premier sells it. It comes in a tub. Man, I am not 100% convinced that this isn't Gatorade. It smells just like Gatorade. I think it's got sugar in it, electrolytes. Um, you just pour it in. You scoop it out. It's a powder. Mix it in with their water. Stir it up. And again, it's called Blue Light. Um, I believe it's spelled L-I-T-E. 
Um, you just mix it in. It makes them go after the water a little bit more. You know, another simple fix, another simple fix is to go to a tractor supply and get yourself an electrolyte pack and just dump it in there. Uh, you know, in a, in a pinch, you can even add a little bit of molasses to the water and help them to go after water a little bit more. You know, if you really need an animal to drink water and you're in a pinch, just add a little bit of molasses to it. It's got sugar in it. It makes it taste better. It smells a little bit better. They're going to go after a little bit more. So good question. We bought warmer that is like grain supposed to give one tenth of a bag per hundred pounds of body weight. This is our first time with goats. Please help us get them healthy. Yeah, not a problem. Um, the good news is there's a couple of resources that you can do. Um, you can check out our YouTube videos. That's a great way to do it. You can hang out here on our live stream. The other thing you can do is we have a Facebook group. Um, it's called Lonessa Farms Tack Box. You can just go on Facebook and you can ask questions till you're blue in the face on there. It is highly, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We keep an eye on things on the on our Facebook group, uh, uh, Lonessa Farms Tack Box. Uh, if there's like bullies on there, if there's spam, whatever, we just get rid of people. So it is a safe place for you to ask questions and get answers and learn things. Um, and there's always people on there that are very, very happy to help you out. And you don't have to worry about getting like beat up by people, people calling you names or calling you dumb or saying dumb stuff. We just get rid of them if they do that. It's a safe place for you to learn. Just go to uh, Facebook and do searching groups for Lanessa Farms Tack Box. I started doing blogs that you can check out. Um, you can just, again, go to www dot lenessafarms.com click on blogs and as we're posting things on uh the facebook group i'm writing these articles for you to refer back to as well um just trying to give you guys as much information as we can not a problem don't stress out none of this stuff is rocket science i'm learning new stuff every day so is everybody else we're just a nice little community of people that get together um very low key very low stress um i am 100 percent convinced you can find all the information that you need to find. Check out our videos on warming. Check our videos on the trifecta method of warming. Um, you'll be fine. Just watch as much as, read as much as you can get your hands on. Look at as much as you, you can get your hands on. You know, the main thing is, is make sure that you're getting good quality information. Be very cautious. There are lots of people out there that have no problem whatsoever giving you bad advice. Um, and you got to be careful. So, you know, university studies, um, I know Maryland, small room in it. Uh, uh, shoot, there's tons of different um, websites and universities that post online um, that you can get great, great information. So uh, make sure that you check out our videos and hop on the group and let us know if you have any questions. Hi from Australia. Hey, Peter. It's nice to see you. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're enjoying. I know we had a friend in Australia that said that they were doing good. Uh, the weather was nice, so we're super jealous. We hope you're doing well, and thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Will she be okay if free grazing on oats that uh, have yet to grain? Uh, not enough information for me to know to give you a, a, a good answer. And I don't have any experience with this at all. I can tell you that there's probably no way that they're going to get all of their nutritional needs met, um, just by free ranging oats, um, oats and all grains go through different phases of development, um, where their protein and fiber content changes drastically in a very, very short window of time. So, you know, there's different stages of oats and other grains. We call it uh, early boot stage, milk stage, boot stage. There's lots of different phases it goes through. And so when we bail these uh, things like oats and things like that, there's a very small window of time that we want to hit it and get it when it's just right. And a lot of these grasses and legumes are that way. You know, alfalfa is that way, clover is that way. So it's very difficult for me to tell you because you're going to have different nutritional value based off of where that that forage is and those grains are in their stage of development. You will go really high protein 
and then very quickly that protein will start to degrade over time. All the protein, things start to degrade, things start to change to starches, you start losing, you get sun bleaching and other things. So it's very, very difficult for me to tell you if it would be okay. I can tell you without a doubt, it is not 100% balanced to be all that they would need. Um, so you, without a doubt, you're going to have to add some kind of, of mineral um, kind of supplementation to them to make sure that they're getting what they need. But that's a that's a fair question and a, and a good question. So thank you. What do you recommend when your sheep has a swollen jaw? Uh, that is Pandora's box of, uh, of, of all questions. So um, it depends. Uh, it depends on if you're looking at bottle jaw, if you're looking at, um, so there's like right off the cuff, there's three different things that you could be looking at. If you just have a bump on one side, um, depending on where that is, it could be an abscess of some sort. Um, and that's a whole nother story of what type of abscess that might be. If the entire bottom of the jaw is, is swollen, uh, you're probably looking at bottle jaw, which is caused by third spacing, which is edema, which is usually due to a heavy parasite load. Um, if you're looking at a ball on the uh, throat, on the Adam's apple area, you may be dealing with a goiter, uh, which may tell you that you're dealing with an iodine deficiency. So it really depends on what it specifically looks like. 90% of the time you're dealing with bottle jaw. And if you're dealing with bottle jaw, you're usually dealing with a parasite load. So we have some videos on this um, and some there's other resources online that you can check out. The keyword that you're going to want to look for when you're Googling or when you're looking at our videos is the term bottle jaw. So just like glass bottle, B-O-T-T-L-E, um, jaw. And they're gonna talk to you about what that means. Chances are you need to check your animals for worms and a heavy parasite load. That's more than likely what's causing it to happen. Kindig, Kindig, don't forget to like. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do appreciate that. Your likes and subscribes do make a very big difference in how much um, a lot of you that are like, just one day you came across us and you found us online. It's because of the likes and the subscribes. The more likes and subscribes we get, the more the YouTube uh, AI and logarithms and all those things say that we're popular and the more they advise other people to watch us, um, the more we pop up in people's feeds. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. My kids are eating a mix with beet flakes soaked in molasses water with sunflower oil plus. Wow, that sounds good. Um, and lucerne chaff plus steamed barley and oats and a few other grains well holy smokes magpie your goats are eating better than i am um that is awesome keep us posted on that and let us know um kind of kind of let us know what your gains are how they're looking how they're acting um and i would be interested to see how they're growing that's awesome though that is a that is a really nice mix uh that you've got going on there I would like to add a lot more body condition in good perspective to a few does. What would you feed? That would depend on the time of year and what you have going on. But if you just want to feed them out, um, I would say the best way to do that would be to feed them separately. If I knew I had a couple animals that I really wanted to get better condition on, and they had the genetic propensity to do so. A lot of this is genetics. It is amazing. You can get two animals and feed them exactly the same. And one is going to have a better genetic propensity for growth than another. And one's going to respond to feed better than another. One's going to have better feed conversion ratio than the other. So, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. But let's assume that you have a couple animals that have really good genetic propensity for growth and you just want to add some good, healthy size to them. Um, the s slow and steady wins the race. Pushing them really, really hard and really, really fast with really, really high protein um, is 
is potentially going to mess up their rumen. Um, it's potentially going to give them scours and you could, you know, end up with other issues like laminitis and things like that. I think the best way to do this is, is to slowly increase their feed. And if you can do it, feeding them multiple times a day will help as well. You're going to get way farther. Let's say in a perfect world, you could feed them three times a day as opposed to one time a day. I think that would make a huge difference um, because their overall total intake is going to be a little bit higher. I would consider getting about a 16% protein mix, um, anywhere from 14 to 16% protein mix of good quality grain mix. Um, and I would make sure that it's well balanced specifically for them. And I would start feeding them a, uh, a pound to two pounds per head per day in two to three different feedings. So I'm saying total in the day, two pounds. So, you know, we're looking at uh, dividing that up uh, in two feedings. So maybe a pound in the morning and a pound in the afternoon. And just let them get used to that. Let them do that for, you know, a couple days uh, to a week. And then maybe next week, add in a half a pound more. And you'll find that they'll work themselves up uh, to where they're able to clean it up and just kind of go from there. Continually monitor their uh, fat cover. Continually, you know, feel those ribs and feel if they're getting good fat cover on those ribs and just go from there. Give them good minerals. Give them the best minerals you can give them. Give them good uh, quality hay, uh, good clean water, low stress environment where they don't have to fight against other people for their feed. And you'll notice slowly but surely they'll come around and after a couple months, you'll have some really, really nicely conditioned animals. Then you're just on cruise control. Then it's like, okay, then you can start cutting back your feed and just kind of coast with them and get them where they need to go. Our two goats were from Craigslist two hours away and became a rescue mission. Once we got there, uh, very bony ribs, spine and hip bones, all predominantly protruding. We got 16% sweet feed, a mineral block. You know, again, watch the videos, see what we have to say about that. Kind of go off of what I just said. The main thing that you need to do first and foremost is you need to get those animals healthy and get them cleaned up. So you need to focus on overall health, get them vaccinated, get them their CDT vaccine, Clostridium type C and D and the tetanus. The next thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you've got them cleaned up from any parasites. You've got them cleaned up from any kind of coccidia. Give them a good clean slate to start from, then slowly start introducing feed. Don't make the mistake of just going out there and just pouring the feed to them. You're going to upset them, you're going to make them sick, and you're going to have all kinds of problems. Again, kind of like we talked about uh, with apple blossom boars, just kind of slow and steady wins the race. You've got time, but you need to address their overall health first before you concern yourself too much uh with the feed aspect well hey lynn i haven't heard from you in a while i hope you're doing well uh where do you get roasted soybeans i've been wanting to add this to our show goats but i can't find it around here north georgia area oof i don't know we sell it on foundation feed or on uh, lanessafarms.com um you can get that from us if you wanted to buy in bulk uh, I can probably work something out with you to get it. I can also ask some questions to see where we can get it. The best thing that you guys can do is go to your local feed mill um, or go to your local co-op or call your local, like find a big sheep or goat guy or gal in your area and just call them and be like, hey, you know, where where's the best place? For, and most people will help you. Most people will tell you. Um, but grain... Uh, Grain co-ops, things like that are a good place to start. Um, you can always contact me too. Send me an email at customer service at lanessafarms.com and I'll work with you to help you get what you need. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am learning as I go with this thing too. Sometimes things work and some things uh, don't, not, not a... Um, not a problem. Any advice on blindness with sheep? Uh, generally speaking, blindness in sheep is going to be due to, uh, 
Well, it's going to be due to neurological issues. Um, the most common one is going to be a vitamin B deficiency. Um, so that would be a thymine deficiency, and that can be caused by a whole lot of different reasons. Um, it can just be a general um, deficiency. It can be due to complications regarding coccidia. Then you can get into other issues such as um, infections getting into the spine or into the brain. So then you're looking at things like listeria. So that is a heavy duty question. Uh, general advice on blindness in sheep, that's the one that you want to contact your veterinarian on. <clears throat> I suppose if I had a sheep or a goat that came down with acute blindness and I had no um, no ability to contact a vet or do anything, I would start treating that animal with uh, thymine, with uh, vitamin B, fortified vitamin B complex, and hope for the best. Um, uh, it would be interesting to know if they have like hind end paralysis or anything like that. But again, like that's a, that's a one that you would want to talk to your veterinarian about for sure. Yes, you can uh, <laughs> tell, tell. Uh, so, you, so they say, can I technically deworm my does even though they were two months pregnant? Yep. Uh, and then I know about valbazin. So they're just saying, hey, I know I'm not supposed to give valbazin uh, to pregnant animals. So yeah, um, if you can work with your veterinarian to find something safe, I think Safeguard is a decent option. I think Dectamax is a decent option. But <clears throat> again, you know, you're always rolling the dice when you start treating pregnant animals with medications because anything that you're going to do uh, that's going to cause stress can can, you know, cause problems. These are second round of kids, much more stocky and fleshy. They don't eat much, but it's made a world of difference. Yeah. So, you know, a ton of feed versus the right feed. Like what's better? You know, it's no different than than us and our kids, right? Like, you know, highly fortified, good quality feeds uh, are important. Um, more so than just feeding a lot of junk. So be cautious and keep that in mind all right yay i caught up um thank you all for your questions uh tonight i really appreciate all of you and what you do to help out our channel uh we have new videos coming out all the time make sure that you check out our videos at lanessafarms.com uh make sure you check out our blogs if you're not a member of our facebook group yet please feel free to join if you know anyone you would like me to interview if you think that you would like to interview with me and talk about things, or if you have a favorite producer or someone in your area that you think would be great for us to interview and share with other people, let us know. Uh, contact me, send me an email at customer service at lanessafarms.com and talk to me, let me know, and I will reach out to them and we can do an interview. We can have them as a guest on here. So again, pleasure talking to all of you. I hope your new year is off to a fantastic start and I will be talking to you all again very soon. So I am Tim from Lanessa Farms, specialty in heirloom livestock. Thanks for joining me again today. And I look forward to seeing all of you again next time.